The Philosophy of Tolkien The World View Behind the Lord of the Rings Section 12 Ethics, the Hard Virtues Virtues can be classified in many ways. One way is hard versus soft. Our ancestors were better at the hard ones, like courage, duty, honor, chastity, and obedience. We are better at the soft ones, like pity, mercy, sensitivity, and humility. We are shocked by their cruelty, they would be equally shocked by our laxity. Section 12.1 Do principles or consequences make an act good? There are ten men in a lifeboat, starving. If they kill one man and eat his flesh, nine will live. If they do not, all ten will die. Which is the ethically right choice? This is the classic example that distinguishes an absolutistic ethic of duty from a relativistic ethic of utility. The end justifies the means. Other examples would be waging a preventive war, assassinating a dictator, or burning incense to Caesar and calling him a god so that your family will not be fed to the lions in the Colosseum. Does the end, in both senses of consequences and motive, justify the means in these cases? Or are there absolute principles that must be obeyed no matter what the consequences? The two answers can be labeled utilitarianism versus principialism, or relativism versus absolutism. The basic difference between the two answers lies in what justifies a moral choice. Is it obedience to principles that are a priori, there before the act? Or is it your estimation of the good and bad consequences caused by the act, that come after it, a posteriori? This can be illustrated by a diagram. Elrond's last words to the fellowship, which his council had chosen, as they exit Rivendell on their world-saving task, are, you do not yet know the strength of your hearts, and you cannot foresee what each may meet upon the road. Look not too far ahead, Lord of the Rings, page 274. We find in the Lord of the Rings four arguments for principialism and against utilitarianism. They are implicit in the plot, of course, rather than explicitly argued, for Tolkien is not writing philosophy but story. But sometimes stories showing can be more convincing than philosophies arguing. There is, first, an epistemological argument. It is the simple fact that we do not know the future. We are not God. For these things change. But our marching orders, our principles, do not. They are unchanging and universal, not dependent on time or place. And they are what we do know. Tolkien never comes closer to summarizing his ethics than in Aragorn's reply to Amr's question. It is hard to be sure of anything among so many marvels. The world is all grown strange. Elf and dwarf and company walk in our daily fields, and folk speak with the lady of the wood and yet live, and the sword comes back to war that was broken in the long ages ere the fathers of our fathers rode into the mark. How shall a man judge what to do in such times? As he ever has judged, said Aragorn. Good and ill have not changed since yesteryear, nor are they one thing among elves and dwarves and another among men. It is a man's part to discern them. As much in the Goldenwood as in his own house, Loatra, pages 427-28. We know these principles, but not infallibly. We must discern them. And sometimes this is very hard, as in the choices of Master Samwise, when Sam thought Frodo had been killed by Shelob and could not clearly discern whether to take the ring or to stay with his master, Lord of the Rings, pages 711, 725. Our reasoning is not always right and sometimes must be overwritten by a deeper knowledge, thus Sam's interior dialogue on Mount Doom. His calculating voice says, You are the fool, going on hoping and toiling. You could have lain down and gone to sleep together two days ago, if you hadn't been so dogged. But you'll die just the same, or worse. You might just as well lie down now and give it up. You'll never get to the top anyway. And then his deeper wisdom answers. I'll get there, if I leave everything but my bones behind, said Sam. And I'll carry Mr. Frito up myself, if it breaks my back and heart. So stop arguing. Lord of the Rings page. 918. Notice that Sam's deeper wisdom treats his rationalizing voice as another, not as himself. What passes for reasoning is often rationalizing, 
and our deeper reason knows it. Moral absolutism is not arrogant but humble. It claims absolute status for principles, not for our knowledge of them. It is moral relativism that is arrogant, both because it will not bow to principles and because it plays God in assuming we can know the future, the consequences, like a soldier disobeying his orders because he thinks he knows better than his commanding officer. A second argument for absolutism is an anthropological argument. Here again the difference is exactly the reverse of what the relativist claims. The relativist claims that his philosophy is personalistic and warm, designed to love and help people. After all, principles are for people, not vice versa. But in fact, as we shall see in the plot of the Lord of the Rings, the relativist's flexibility actually harms people rather than helping them while the absolutist's adherence to principles helps people. So the real personalism is principialism. It is the utilitarian who will sacrifice persons if necessary, like Saruman. The utilitarian ranks quantity over quality, and calculates that nine live cannibals in a lifeboat are better than ten dead heroes. Principles are indeed for persons rather than vice versa. That's why they are so absolute, especially principles like loyalty and friendship. Tolkien's heroes are certainly not unfeeling legalists. Duty is really to persons, not to principles. Frodo says, at the Black Gate, I am commanded to go to the land of mortar, and therefore I shall go. If there is only one way, then I must take it. What comes after must come, Lord of the Rings, page. 624. Note the last sentence. Tolkien is deliberately rejecting utilitarianism with its calculation of consequences, like how in, Frodo has been commanded, by a person, not a principle. And he knows and trusts his commanders, Elrond and Gandalf, and therefore obeys them. He does not say, as Kant did, that he obeys reason, or duty, or the categorical imperative. He does not say, I think my rational duty is this, and I obey it. Ultimately, Obedience and duty come down to knowing, trusting, and loving a person. A third argument for absolutism is psychological. It is very simple, bad people are often utilitarians. Utilitarianism tempts you to badness, it is a very convenient excuse for doing something bad. The Saruman's argument to Gandalf, Lord of the Rings, page 253, for joining the apparently inevitable winner, saw Urin before it's too late. But good people are not utilitarians. Why? Because they exercise the great non-utilitarian moral virtues, charity, self-forgetfulness, self-sacrifice. Gandalf chose to come himself, and he was the first to be lost, answered Gimli. His foresight failed him. The counsel of Gandalf was not founded on foreknowledge of safety, for himself or for others, said Aragorn. Lord of the Rings, page 430. Gandalf's counsel is the heart of Tolkien's ethics. It is short and sweet, hard and true, to cast aside regret and fear. To do the deed at hand, Lord of the Rings, page 507. A fourth argument for moral absolutism is a historical one. It is an argument not from principles but from consequences. In fact, it is a consequentialist argument against consequentialism. It is that the consequences of consequentialism are bad, and the consequences of principialism are good. Consequentialism gives up too easily. Frodo, seeing the vast army of mortar, at first thinks, I am too late. All is lost. I tarried on the way. All is lost. Even if my errand is performed, no one will ever know. There will be no one I can tell. It will be in vain. But, then, despair had not left him, but the weakness had passed. He even smiled grimly, feeling now as clearly as a moment before he had felt the opposite, that what he had to do, he had to do, if he could, and that whether Farmir or Aragorn or Elrond or Galadriel or Gandalf or anyone else ever knew about it was beside the purpose, Lord of the Rings, page 692. C.S. Lewis defended moral absolutism and attacked utilitarianism in many places, for instance, in the first book of mere Christianity, in one of the century's most prophetic books, The Abolition of Man, 
which is too long to quote but not too long to read, and in a shorter article The Poison of Subjectivism. One of the sharpest examples of the conflict between duty and utility in his fiction is Degory's choice in the magician's nephew to obey a slin and not accept a magic apple from the witch even though it would have healed his dying mother. A slin tells him that it would have healed her, but not to your joy or hers. The day would have come when both you and she would have looked back and said it would have been better to die in that illness. That is what would have happened, child, with a stolen apple. It is not what will happen now. What I give you now will bring joy. It will not, in your world, give endless life, but it will heal. Go. Pluck her an apple from the tree. Here, as in Tolkien, consequentialism has bad consequences and obedience to duty rather than consequences has good ones. It is the principle of first and second things, see Lewis's essay by the title in God in the Dock. Section 12.2 why must we be heroes? A hero is a person who acts courageously. In a fallen world, courage is among the most important of virtues. Chesterton, musing on Gethsemane and Calvary, notes that Christianity is the only religion which adds courage to the virtues of the Creator. Tolkien says, the good of the world depends on the behavior of an individual in circumstances which demand of him suffering and endurance far beyond the normal demand a strength of body and mind which he does not possess, letters, number. 181, page. 234. A recent book on the Lord of the Rings notes that a big part of the reason Frodo's courage is so inspiring is its contrast to his culture. His upbringing nurtured the pursuit of happy ease. Have you ever wondered why our favorite stories tend to include an ordinary person overcoming great odds to accomplish something extraordinary? It's because the capacity and desire to be heroic resides deep within each of us. Rocky Balboa. Luke Skywalker. Forrest Gump. William Wallace. Gideon. Wilberforce. Rosa Parks. C.S. Lewis says of courage, as Johnson points out, where courage is not, no other virtue can survive except by accident, surprised by joy. Page. 161. Courage is not simply one of the virtues, but the form of very virtue at the testing point, which means, at the point of highest reality, the scret tape letters, page.148. Lewis points out that Jesus was not a man of great natural courage, as seen by Gethsemane. Neither was Tolkien, as seen by letter 210. Jesus was like Frodo. Section 12.3 Can one go on without hope? There are two kinds of hope, as there are two kinds of faith. One kind lives only on the conscious surface of the self, in the feelings and the mind. This kind often has to be killed in order for the deeper hope to emerge. The fellowship often has to do without this surface hope, especially after the loss of Gandalf and Moria and Winfredo and Sam crawl through mortar. But they continue to act, to fight, to give every ounce of themselves because of a deeper hope which is much harder to identify or define. Let us look at these two kinds of hope in the text. Nearly every time Tolkien uses the word, he means surface hope, and when it disappears, deep hope takes over and the result is not an action or surrender but total commitment to battle and action. After Gandalf's death in Moria, Aragorn, now in command, says. Farewell, Gandalf. Did I not say to you? If you pass the doors of Moria, beware. Alas that I spoke true. What hope have we without you? He turned to the company. We must do without hope, he said, Lord of the Rings, page. 324. When Frodo and Sam first approach the Black Gate, it seems absolutely hopeless to try to sneak in past thousands of orcs. But Frodo's face was grim and set, but resolute. He was filthy, haggard and pinched with weariness, but he cowered no longer, and his eyes were clear. I purpose to enter mortar, and I know no other way. Therefore I shall go this way. I do not ask anyone to go with me, Sam said nothing. The look on Frido's face was enough for him, he knew that words of his were useless. And after all he never had any real hope in the affair from the beginning, but being a cheerful hobbit he had not needed hope as long as despair could be postponed. Now they were come to the bitter end. 
But he had stuck to his master all the way, that was what he had chiefly come for, and he would still stick to him. His master would not go to Mordor alone. Sam would go with him, Lord of the Rings, pages. 623, 624. An even more total despair settles upon the fellowship outside the Black Gate. For it seems the whole quest has failed in Frodo and the ring have been captured when Saw Urin's messenger brings out Frodo's sword, cloak, brooch, and my thrill mail shirt. A blackness came over their eyes, and it seemed to them in a moment of silence that the world stood still, but their hearts were dead and their last hope gone, Lord P.F. The Rings, page. 871. Yet they do not yield, but fight to the end. Pippin's last thought is, so it ends as I guessed it would, his thought said, even as it fluttered away. And it laughed a little within him ere it fled, almost gay it seemed to be casting off at last all doubt and care and fear, Lord of the Rings, page. 874. Frido and Sam also lose hope, yet continue to act, when approaching Mount Doom. Frido says to Sam, near the end. Lead me. As long as you've got any hope left. Mine is gone, Lord of the Rings, page. 907. So that was the job I felt I had to do when I started, thought Sam, to help Mr. Frodo to the last step and then die with him? Well, if that is the job then I must do it. But even as hope died in Sam, or seemed to die, it was turned into a new strength. Sam's plain hobbit face grew stern, almost grim, as the will hardened in him, and he felt through all his limbs a thrill as if he was turning into some creature of stone and steel that neither despair nor weariness nor endless barren miles could subdue. What is this deeper hope that emerges when all hope is gone? What is its object? It is not a feeling of optimism, a Mr. Micawber philosophy of something will turn up. Quite the contrary. Galadriel warns Frodo, your quest stands upon the edge of a knife. Stray but a little, and it will fail, to the ruin of all. Lord of the Rings, page. 348. That hardly sounds like optimism. It is certainly not calculation, not utility. In fact, it arises only when calculation and utility fail. As Gabriel Marcel says, while the structure of the world we live in permits, and may even seem to counsel, absolute despair, yet it is only such a world that can give rise to an unconquerable hope. So its object is not the world as seen. Despair of that world seems to be the precondition for hope in the deeper sense. But hope's object is not miracle, and not, at least not explicitly, another world that begins only after death, as a kind of compensation for loss in this one. In this world, as Gandalf says, the enemy is strong beyond our reckoning, yet we have a hope at which he has not guessed, Lord P.F. The Rings, page.505. Hope's object is persons and their emeth, their trustworthiness, and the trust, loyalty, and friendship between them. At first the hope of the fellowship is lodged in Gandalf, rightly, for he is really one of the Mayar, an archangel sent to this world only to combat Sauron, as he reveals at the end, Lord of the Rings, page. 950. Gandalf returns from death, like Christ, in the morning light, even the Easter date is noted, March 1st. If anyone else but Gandalf had sent Frodo and Sam into Mordor on an apparently hopeless errand, no one could have had hope for the errand. Hope for the task depends on trust in the taskmaster. Hope's object is always a person, not an idea or ideal, not even the fulfillment of the task. Frodo, in fact, loses hope in his task, but he still has hope in Sam. Sam never did have much hope for the task, the object of his deep hope is Frodo and that hope is not disappointed. Even as they prepare to die on Mount Doom, he is happy because his master is free. Hope's object is always personal, but it is never oneself. Hope in oneself is either foolish vanity or even more foolish pride. That is why even a mere thing is a surer sign of hope than a person if the thing is outside yourself and the person is yourself. The Sam sighting of the star in mortar is, for me the most moving passage in the entire book. There, peeping among the cloud rack above a dark door high up in the mountains Sam saw a white star twinkle for a while. The beauty of it smote his heart, 
as he looked up out of the forsaken land, and hope returned to him. For like a shaft, clear and cold, the thought pierced him that in the end the shadow was only a small and passing thing, there was light and high beauty forever beyond its reach, Lord of the Rings, page. 901. Hope is like the sky, unconquerable and spread over everything. Hope's object is not limited to particulars, it is universal, it is the nature of things, it is being a self. Thus Marcel says. To hope against all hope that a person whom I love will recover from a disease which is said to be incurable is to say, it is impossible that I should be alone in willing this cure, it is impossible that reality in its inward depth should be hostile or so much as indifferent to what I assert is in itself a good. It is quite useless to tell me of discouraging cases or examples, beyond all experience, all probability, all statistics, I assert that a given order shall be established, that reality is on my side in willing it to be so. I do not wish, I assert, such is the prophetic tone of true hope, philosophy of existentialism, page. 17. Since. 1. Hope's object is always in the last analysis a person not an abstraction, and sense. 2. That object is also in the last analysis universal and not particular, it follows that. 3. That object must always, at least implicitly and anonymously, be God, the only concrete universal, the only person, I, who is also being, I am. Which brings us back to the traditional Christian labeling of hope as one of the three theological virtues that is, God-oriented virtues. We do not enter a C.S. Lewis quotation on this topic here not because there is too little but because there is too much. This is Lewis's most distinctive theme, and in light of all that he has written about this, in his autobiography Surprised by Joy, in the Heaven chapter in The Problem of Pain, in the introduction to The Pilgrim's Regress, in the Hope chapter in Mere Christianity, and in The Weight of Glory, we need another whole book to begin to do it justice. I offer you my own very feeble attempt to do just that, Heaven, the Heart's Deepest Longing, San Francisco, Ignatius Press, 1981. Instead, here is a single sentence from Lewis's autobiography, as a sort of test, it is more important that Heaven should exist than that any of us should get there. If you understand this sentence, it may take years. You will understand three things about this deep hope, why it comes when other hope fails, why it is hope and what does not depend on yourself, and why it nevertheless does not lead you to resignation and passivity but steals you for action. All three effects flow from the same fact that, like charity, it dissenters you from yourself. Section 12.4 Is authority oppressive and obedience to meaning? Frito is a Marian figure. His fiat. I will take the ring though I do not know the way, Lautre, p. 264, is strikingly similar to Mary's, let it be to me according to your word, LK 138. They are opposite sides. Of the same coin, Mary consented to carry the Savior of the whole world, the Christ, to birth, to life, and Frodo consented to carry the destroyer of the whole world, the ring, the Antichrist, to its death, Mary gave life to life, Christ, Frodo gave death to death, the ring. We all, like Frodo, carry a quest, a task, our daily duties. They come to us, not from us. We are free only to accept or refuse our task, and, implicitly, our taskmaster. None of us is a free creator or designer of his own life. None of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself, Rom 14-7. Either God, or fate, or meaningless chance has laid upon each of us a task, a quest, which we would not have chosen for ourselves. We are all hobbits who love our shire, our security, our creature comforts, whether these are pipe wheat, mushrooms, five meals a day, and local gossip, or Starbucks coffees, recreational sex, and politics. But something, some authority not named in the Lord of the Rings, but named in the Silmarillion, has decreed that a quest should interrupt this delightful Epicurean garden and send us on an odyssey. We are plucked out of our hobbit holes and plunked down onto a road. That gives us our fundamental choice between obedience and disobedience. And if life is war, obedience is essential. 
It is the first virtue for a soldier. C.S. Lewis says that obedience accepted with delight and authority exercised with humility are the very lines along which our spirits live, the weight of glory, page. 115. And if you ask why we should obey God, in the last resort the answer is, I am. To know God is to know that our obedience is due to Him, surprised by joy, p. 231. Like Frodo, Lewis believes in an ethic of duty and obedience rather than an ethic of consequences, to play well the scenes in which we are on concerns us much more than guessing about future scenes, the world's last night, page. 104. Section 12.5. Our promise is sacred. This is a single concept, though there is not a single word for it in English. Honesty has been too often trivialized in modern parlance to mean mere candor, which is often only shamelessness, not a virtue but a vice. In Hebrew there is a single word, and it is emeth, truth, but the truth not only of a thought or even of a deed but of a person, or a person's character. It is one of the primary attributes of God in the Old Testament. It is manifested especially in keeping promises. It can be seen best, perhaps, by contrasting two concrete characters, Farmir and Baramr. But we must simply forget, if not forgive, the movie's gratuitous redrawing of the character of Farmir as crafty and suspicious and lusting after the ring. Rather, we must remember his noble words. I would not snare even an orc with a falsehood, said Faramir, Lord of the Rings, page. 949. We are truth speakers, we men of Gondor. We boast seldom, and then perform, or die in the attempt. Not if I found it on the highway would I take it I said. Even if I were such a man as to desire this thing, and even though I knew not clearly what this thing was when I spoke, still I should take those words as a vow, and be held by them. Lord P.F. The Rings, pages. 665, 666. Baramr, on the other hand, betrays his vow to the fellowship to protect the ring bearer when he succumbs to ring lust and tries to lure Frodo into giving him the ring, then tries to take it by force. But Baramr is only stubborn and weak, and repents. The more complete lack of meth is found in We Gollum. Perhaps the best character to contrast him with would be a meth himself in C.S. Lewis is the last battle, he has lost his soul, his eye, his integrity. He can no longer even use that sacred word, the word God revealed as his own eternal name in the burning bush, C.X. 314. He speaks of himself in the plural, we, us, or in the third person, they took his precious and he's lost now, Lord of the Rings, page. 602 until Frodo binds him with the promise. No, I will not take it, the elf rope, off you, said Frodo, not unless he paused a moment in thought, not unless there is any promise you can make that I can trust. We will swear to do what he wants, yes, yes, said Gollum. We promises, yes I promise, said Gollum. I will serve the master of the precious, Lord P.F. The Rings, pages. 603. 604. The I and the promise necessarily go together. How important are promises? Keeping them was the main thinking Theoden was eulogized for, he kept his oaths, Lotr, p. 851. When Aragorn took the paths of the dead, really, the undead, he roused them to fight and thus gave them the rest they had been denied because they had broken their oath to fight against Sauron. Oathbreakers, why have ye come? And a voice was heard out of the night that answered him, as if from far away, to fulfill our oath and have peace, Lord of the Rings, page. 772. Promise keeping is the fundamental thing that holds all societies together. It is the root of all law and thus of all social stability. Personal integrity is the basis for social integrity. All pre modern societies knew that. Tolkien notes that promises were held sacred and of old all but the wickedest things feared to break them, Lord P.F. The Rings, page. 12. The consequences of promise-breaking are the loss of personal integrity. And the consequences of that are Gollum's inner hell, which is the exact opposite of Sartre's no exit, where hell is other people. Gollum's hell is the withdrawal from the other, as it is in Charles Williams's truly terrifying descent into hell. 
The virtue of Ameth is the precondition for all virtue. There can no more be any other virtue without truthfulness than there can be any successful operation without light in the operating room. Even moral relativists know this, no one admires a man who lies to himself, who sins against his own conscience. Even the wicked have this light, for it is the light that enlightens every man who comes into the world, CJN 1-9. Without it, nothing. And with it, everything. There is no more life-transforming reform than total honesty, the absolute refusal to lie to oneself or others. Ask anyone in AA that's why we need purgatory, for our sins to come into the light. That's why practicing the presence of God and memento mori, remember death, is the way to sanctity, there are not many sins a man will commit on his deathbed. C.S. Lewis was an absolutist about honesty, especially in Man or Rabbit, if Lewis could make everyone in our world read any one short essay or chapter he wrote, I think he would choose that one. It begins with a question, can't you lead a good life without believing in Christianity? And his answer is to question the question. The question sounds as if it were asked by a person who said to himself, I don't care whether Christianity is in fact true or not. All I'm interested in is leading a good life. I'm going to choose beliefs not because I think them true but because I find them helpful. Now frankly, I find it hard to sympathize with this state of mind. If Christianity is untrue, then no honest man will want to believe it, however helpful it might be, if it is true, every honest man will want to believe it, even if it gives him no help at all. Thank you for listening. If you like this audiobook please like, and share it and subscribe to our channel.